So this is Smidgley, Alabama, 1970. For the sake of the recording, I apologize for any coughing or sputtering. I'm getting over chest infection, so. That's okay. Uh, thank you. It's written by Stacey Bean. Please forgive us, Stacey. We may not do it in a wonderful Southern accent. We're probably going to be very British about it. Uh, Smidgley, Alabama, 1974, fade in. Exterior, small town street day. On a quiet street in a small town, Merlene Cleary, 49, drives her beat up wreck of a car slowly from house to house, staring at the houses as she passes them. Superimposed, Smidgley, Alabama, 1974. Merlene wears old jeans and a worn tank top with a black bra strap hanging down on her arm. She's angry, determined, deep in thought and smoking furiously. Finally, the car comes to a slow stop beneath a large shady oak tree. She kills the engine, takes a long drag on her cigarette and tosses the cigarette out of the window. She takes car keys in one hand and reaches for something in the seat behind her. Interior close up on car seat day. Marlene places her hand on the sword off shotgun in the car seat. Exterior street day. Marlene climbs out of the car carrying the shotgun, slips her keys into her pants pocket and slams the car door shut. She slowly makes her way up the street. Exterior street day, further up the street, Merlin stops and stares at a particular house. She freezes. Exterior close up on house day. The house of Merlin's obsession is a very nice two story house with white wooden siding and pretty blue shutters on the windows. It's not the home of a wealthy person, but definitely one of the nicer and more tasteful homes in this town. It's the home of a striver. Exterior street day, Merlin quick. Merlene quickly scampers across the nicely manicured lawn of the house and stops just before the front stoop to notice a bush that's blooming with pink and white azalea flowers. Merlene stares at the beautiful flowers. Shit. Merlene slaps at the flowers until they explode into the air in a cloud of pink and white petals. She scampers up the front steps and across a big front porch and knocks loudly on the front door. She waits for a second, then bangs on the door. Slowly the front door opens. <coughs> Interior point of view, person inside the door, day. From the point of view of the person inside the door, the door slowly opens to reveal an angry Merlene who quickly raises her shotgun in the air and points it at the person. The person's hand is seen quickly trying to slam the door shut, but Merlene kicks it open. I told you. I told you what would happen if you messed with me. You just had to do it, didn't you? God damn you. I warned you. I warned you. Merlene fires the shotgun. Exterior front porch day. Merlene stares down the person she has just shot, angry and smiling. I told you you weren't better than me, but you thought you were. You thought you were better than everybody in this town. Well, I showed you. I showed you. Merlene backs up a couple of steps, proud of her accomplishment. Now we'll see who runs this goddamn town. Exterior street day, Merlene turns and runs quickly across the yard and back towards her car. Exterior victim's house day, just a few seconds after Merlene disappears, a neighbour to the victim, Lucy Nell, 46, silly and dumpy, crosses the yard carrying a jello salad inside a Tupperware container. She squints in the distance, seeing an unidentified woman trotting down the street. She shrugs it off and keeps walking towards the victim's house. She crosses the porch, stops at the front door, looks down at the victim's body, screams and drops the jello salad on the porch. The green jello splatters all over Lucy Nell. Lucy Nell screams loudly in horror. Interior pack and sack store day. Marlene sits on a stool behind the checkout stand in the pack and sack store. She's smoking a cigarette and wearing the store uniform of polyester plants, a white polyester blouse and red apron. Unlike all the other women in town who wear various versions of modified beehive hairdos, Merlene wears her hair down in no specific shape or style, except for the fact that it always looks slightly askew. Superimposed six months earlier. Interior checkout stands, pack and sack store day. In a wider shot, Merlene's friend Delphine Moore, 48, is also smoking on a stool behind her checkout counter. Delphine wears the same polyester outfit as Merlene, but her hair is slicked back and held in place with a wide white hairband. What time is it, Merlene? Got a watch, don't you? I forgot to wind it. How much longer till we get off? Not soon enough. Kitty Hargrove, 48, pulls up to Merlin's counter, pushing a shopping cart. Kitty wears a cat-sized glasses and stylish baby blue polyester pantsuit with white lapels and white shoes. Her hair is puffed up in the shape of a large football helmet. 
Merlene, which aisle is the ladies' products? The time packs. Don't say it like so loud. Oh, hell, Kitty, there ain't no man within 100 miles of here that besides me and Delp know your business. We're women too, you know. Ain't that right, Delp? Whatever you say. Well, I'm not looking for the T-A-M-P-A-X anyway. I'm looking for the Lady Eve. Oh, douche. Why didn't you just say so? Del, what I was do, Sean? Oh. Kitty and Barris quickly pushes her cart away as she calls behind her. I'll find it myself. You know, I heard that Lady Eve Company was going to start making a strawberry douche. Can you imagine your lady parts smelling like fresh fruit? Good. Kitty needs it. Why do you say that? Have you ever sat real close to her? No. Well, here's some advice. Don't. Delphine giggles, looks up past Merlene, then jumps to her feet and tosses a cigarette aside. Merlene watches Delphine's sudden panic and looks up. Doris K. Doris, 51, the manager of the pack and sack store, is standing at Merlene's checkout counter, hands on hips, staring at Merlene and Delphine. Doris would have been football linebacker had she been a boy. She's built tall, wide, and very sturdy with prominent breasts, thick arms, and solid pot belly. She's a tad built mannish, which she accentuates by wearing a man's tie with a polyester shirt and black army boots with a polyester pants. What do you two, two think you're doing? Nothing, Doris. Oh, that's not Doris. Me. <laughs> I was just about to check Kitty Hargrove out. She's back there getting her some feminine hygiene. What about you? Merlene stands slowly and lazily. Just taking a break, Doris. I think I'm entitled. You're entitled to two five-minute shifts per an eight-hour shift. And so far today, you've had five or six. I've been counting. Okay, okay. It's not like anybody's in here. Fine. And get some Windex and hit those front windows. What? You heard me, Marlene. You got time to lean. You got time to clean. Doris strides away. Jeez. Jesus, she's scary. Mm, don't pay her no mind. <clears throat> she's just mad because her woman's softball team starts practice next week and she's having to get her jock strap yet. Delphi and Bursa start laughing <laughs> and Marlene joins in. They look at each other thinking about what Marlene said and laughs even harder. Edith Atwell, 50, and Lucy Nell Hendricks suddenly appear at Merlin's checkout counter. Edith, the most stylish woman in town, is wearing a peach-colored polyester pantsuit with matching scarf and sports a very high combo beehive bouffant meant to impress. Lucy Nell looks like a slightly pudgier version of Edith with a yellow pantsuit and puffed-up hairdo similar to Edith's, only smaller. Well, 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 ladies, what's so amusing? Marlene and Delphine turn to see Edith and Lucy Nell and immediately stop laughing. Marlene's mood sours. Hello, Edith. Hey, Lucy Nell. Delphine. Yes, well, we're just doing a little shopping. Not that I normally frequent the, uh, what is this place? The Pack and Sack. That's such a cute name. A little crude for my tastes, but cute. I normally purchase my dry goods at the new Walmart outside of town. But they were out of lemon pledge today, and I've just got to get my house dusted. Ladies are coming over this afternoon, you know. And Lucy Nell here said that your little store carries furniture polish. It's on aisle seven with house goods. Uh -huh. I'm sure you don't carry my brand. A place like this probably only carries cheap knockoff brands, but beggars can't be choosers now, can they, girls? Marlene is staring daggers at Edith's smirking smile. Oh, no, Edith, we carry some name brand products, the same as Walmart. Really? Did uh, they fall off a little uh, truck somewhere? Do you have a little dance in the can? The real store wouldn't carry them. 
What's with the new look, Lucy Nell? Lucy Nell steals a glance at Edith and then back at Delphine. What? I don't think I've ever seen you wear anything but blue jeans. What's with the... Uh... Well, Edith took my shopping and... Uh... Doesn't she look nice? I helped to pick out this outfit and we got her hair done. She looks so sweet. What the shit is going on? Oh my. Lucinelle, why don't you run on and get me a can of lemon polish? You probably know where everything is in here. Lucinelle trots away and almost turns her ankle trying to walk in her new platform pumps. Yes, well, Marlene and Delphine, some people are interested in bettering themselves. Lucinelle would like to improve her station in life and I offered to help. I think everybody. Luce, it Edith studies Merlin up and down. Should think about bettering themselves. Lucy now trots back with a can of furniture polish. Here it is. Edith inspects the polish. Oh my. This looks like something you'd clean a pigsty with. Lucy now, are you sure we didn't accidentally stumble into the farmer's feed and grain store? Uh -huh. Edith giggles loudly and Lucy now tries to join in, but Lucy now's laugh is awkward and forced. <laughs> well, I guess it'll have to do. Can you be a doll, Merlene, and ring me up? I'm in a bit of a hurry. Edith sets the polish on Merlene's counter, but Lucy now snatches it up. But I'll get it, Edith. You paid for lunch. <laughs> OK, if you insist. Lucy Nell runs over to Delphine's counter and sets the polish down. Delphine rings it up. Meanwhile, Edith strolls to the front of the store where she can see her reflection in the plate glass window and starts <laughs> looking her hair. What are you doing, Lucy Nell? What do you mean? What, what are you doing hanging out with her? A dollar fourteen. Lucy Nell hands Delphine two dollars. She's promised to help me. Delphine takes some money, high, hits the cash register, the drawer pops open and Delphine counts the change. Help you do what? Do you know how ridiculous you look? 86 cents is your change. I don't think so. I like the way I look. Lucy now puts the change in her purse, snaps her purse shut and picks up the polish. And a purse? You've never carried a purse in your life. Well, I am now. I don't get it. Mm, come on, Lucy Nell. I'll explain later. Lucy Nell trots over to join Edith and they head for the front door. Ladies. Edith saunters away and stops in front of a bargain rack of cheap clothing marked down for a sale. Edith stares at the clothes with disgust. Oh my. Edith exits the store. God, I hate her. Two. She thinks she is so much better than everyone else. I know. Oh my, does your furniture polish have little dents in the cans? A lot of dent her in her cans. That's the 10 page. Ah, that was 10. <laughs> um, huh. Who would like to start? I mean, I can start with my notes that I made pre, pre, and then we're, okay. Um, I get the idea that these women are kind of vying, that they're, they're in competition for, with one another for some bizarre reason. I mean, as a study in the, in the life of, <laughs> of, um, of, 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 uh, a bunch of women <laughs> whose interests seem to be weird clothing and strange hairstyles. It's quite good. And I quite like the descriptions of their clothes and their hairstyles. I think it's probably overdone, but I quite like them all the same. Um, I will say that the writer of this has got their scene headings mixed up with their shots. Um, and and it's it. I've written big notes on this. <laughs> on the first one, interior, close up on car seat day. That is not a scene heading. That is a shot. You need interior, car, day. Then you can put after the day, close on car seat and carry on with a description. 
So you can include the, the shot in the scene heading, but it's in the wrong place. Um, and, then, and then on the same page, in exterior street, exterior street two in close succession, I get that you're further down the street, but you don't need another scene heading. You're, it's the same scene, it's just further down the street. Um, so it's things like, it's little things like that that I mostly picked up on for that. The, um, on page two, interior point of view, person inside the door. Again, not a scene heading. Again, that is a shot, it's not a scene heading. So you really need interior um, <laughs> house or interior hall or something like that. Um, and also then you don't need then to duplicate the from the point of view yeah. of the person inside the door, you know, so <coughs> duplicating it. Also that person, We've said this before in other on previous occasions, you need to identify every single person. You're not writing this like a novel where you can leave that to later and we'll find out who it is later. That person has got to be played by somebody. It can't just be some random person. So we have to identify who that person is so that the actors and the director know <laughs> who it is has just got a shot. Um, if you don't want them to be seen, then you have to give, then you have to, you have to clearly say it's whoever it is, you know. But we only see the hand. Or but we only yeah. see the hand, exactly. So, you know. Um, um, um. And then again on page three, that person becomes the victim suddenly. As we get exterior victim's house. Well, it's kind of like make your mind up. <laughs> Please give this person a name. <laughs> um, um, uh, um, yeah, I, I do like, as I said, I do like the descriptions, but I also did make a note there, which is too much info next to Merlene sits on a stool and she's wearing all this different stuff and she's, you know, great, but it might be just overkill. Um, and then I think, it was just random stuff like caps for giggles and things like that, laughing. Um, and, the, and again, I made notes where it's sort of too much information. Other than that, I like, I like the, there's obviously going to, the, 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 I'm intrigued by these women's relationship. Let's put it that way. I'd like to know, I mean, we have got the rest of the script, but I haven't got time to read the rest of the script. Um, but it does make me wonder where is this going? So that's a good thing. And I'm going to leave it there so somebody else can take over. Stuart. Okay. Um, I quite liked it actually. I, I, first thing, the general point I was, uh, noticed that, uh, which is a great thing is that it's great roles for older women, which is, uh, you know, there's a, it's a common complaint that. Uh, there are not enough roles for older women so well done that's really good to see and and like you um angela i i really wanted to find out some of the backstory about these mm -hmm. characters and that was luring me in to um i was i was intrigued to find out more about these characters which is mm -hmm. great in terms of the writing and the scene setting so that was i i, I like that um, and some of the comedy as well. I, I enjoyed some of the wordplay and the, the, the banter um, uh, very much. So, yeah, I, I, I quite enjoyed it myself, but um, and wanted to know more. So, Fabulous. but, but yes, yeah, similar to you in terms of formatting and, you know, yeah, scenes, I think you know, those things need ironing. It's a bit yeah. like, oh, where am I now and what, what am I doing? Mm. Um, so, yeah, but um, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, John. Yes. Uh, the cons first. It really annoyed me that it was being written by, like it was a book. Like you say, you know, I mean, we he, as actors need to know who's playing who. So to say a mystery person, it doesn't need to be a mystery to us. <laughs> it needs to be a mystery to the audience. But yes, that uh, the pros, I absolutely love the dark humour in it. I really do. It, it pushes all my buttons. I was sniggering away quite happily with this when I first read it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, pretty much as you and Stuart have said, you know, but uh, I just absolutely love the comedy in it. 
Fabulous. Catherine. Um, yeah. <coughs> Again, apologies for the coughing. Um, I, I agree with everybody else. Um, in fact, that POV thing really bugs me that I had that as my notes. And I was like, you've just told us this. Why are you telling us again? Um, so I think um, maybe a proofread just for clean up the, the format before you um, submit it anywhere. Um, but um, you know that's that's technicality stuff um with regards to the piece um very visual i i could see it straight away i think it was written quite well i think the the dialogue um came across with the individuals quite well you could definitely distinctly tell who who they were from what they were saying which is always a a good thing so when the dialogue's definitely that one character talking it's yeah it, it, you can see the visuals quite well with that um speaking of visuals uh, the descriptions of the the costumes and the hairstyles were intriguing. I was a, a little bit confused. They did make me think of Edward Scissorhands a bit, so I wasn't <laughs> sure what kind of theme was going. It was a bit like, oh, it was all dark and grum grumpy, and then it was like all colourful and and beehives. So I was a bit okay. I think that's seventy four is a bit late for beehives. Yeah, though, that's why so. I was kind of that's yeah. not quite right for bee. But maybe maybe the town is a bit backwards. Perhaps they're not quite caught up to the fashion. Maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, yeah. Uh, formatting. You know, again, the, the technical stuff needs to be sorted out. But um, I thought it was very well written. The the, the dark humor was brilliant, and the characters were distinct. So well done so far. John, you wanted to make yes, it. Yes, no, just one thing. Uh, in the middle of the conversation where you've got Edith and Merlin talking to each other, there's one section where it's labelled Merlin, where it's obvious that it's Edith talking. I, I made a note of that as well. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it jolted a bit, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. I think it's just a miss. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I, that's all it is. It's obviously they. It's a typo. It is, it is typo. a proofread, basically. But, yeah. yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for letting us read it. Yeah, thank you. Good.